Gracious Heavenly Father, I just thank you once again for the opportunity that you've given us to feast upon your word. I just ask that you would filter out all of that which is foolish and ignorance, but seal to our hearts that which is truth, that we might grow in grace and knowledge of you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. I uh, introduced you to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 in the last video, the first 11 verses or so. And now I'd like to to spend a little bit more time opening up those verses. The ninth chapter ended with the realization of an agonizing conflict, the training, the, di the discipline, the diet, uh, you know, everything that, that goes with one who enters a contest and intends to win, uh, the illustration the Holy Spirit gave through Paul and for that reason, the Holy Spirit tells us that Paul kept his body in subjection so that when he had preached to others, that he himself would not be disqualified from that contest. And the chapter break isn't there because, brethren, I want you to know I don't want you ignorant of the fact that our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, were all identified into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink were that they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. And yet with the many, God was not well pleased. I'm not sure that we can really wrap our minds around what all was involved in in, in Israel's exodus from the land of Egypt. God had separated Abraham, made certain promises to him. And the size of his nation and his children and, and 70 of them wound up in Egypt, not a very big nation. And they were there for 400 years and could God have done this some other way? Well, the answer is yes, he could have on the one hand. In another sense, no, he couldn't have. The scriptures declare that the way of the Lord is perfect and it's foolish to suggest that he could have done it differently. Of course, he could have done it differently. Things could have came out a whole lot, worked out a whole lot different than what they did, but it would not have been wise and it wouldn't have been right because God doesn't make mistakes. So leave out any questions as to why that they were in Egypt for 400 years. 400 years means nothing to God. It might have meant a lot to the Israelites, you know, but it means nothing to God. They were in Egypt uh, for 400 years for God's purposes and then he redeemed them and not much happened in 400 years. They were uh, situated in Goshen. That's the area that the Pharaoh gave them and, and that was the best area. That was the most fertile area uh, in all of Egypt and that's where they lived. But they were now slaves. They didn't want Moses. Uh, is this not what we said to you when we were in the land? Leave us alone. And folks, we were God's enemies. We were not seeking him. We were not serving him. We were not loving him. We were not working for him. 
And He died in our place and He redeemed us. And He redeemed uh, His people, Israel. Our fathers from the land of Egypt, uh, that as well as a mixed multitude. But if we look at the physical aspects of the redemption of His people, they're staggering. Folks, how could that motley group of people, you know, you know, they, they didn't have they didn't have F eight eighteens and they didn't have ARs, they didn't have cannons, they didn't have rifles, they didn't have grenades, hand grenades, they certainly didn't have nuclear weapons, you know. They were slaves. There's no way in heaven they can make that exodus from the land of Egypt. The only reason there was all that conflict with Pharaoh was that God had to deal with the gods of Egypt. Uh, I believe that was his first purpose. He did that. Then his nation, Israel, his people, as the text says, our forefathers in this particular text, they walked out of that land in one night uh, by some estimates, uh, 600,000 uh, women, children, possessions, all of the, the, the stuff that they were hauling along with them, dragging along behind them, all the, the, their possessions, all the, the treasures from those in Egypt who were glad to get rid of them because of the judgments that God had poured out you know, upon the gods of Egypt. The logistics are staggering. You know, I can imagine the grumbling, the complaining. You know, I can imagine the, the problems that Moses must have faced. They left the land of Egypt. They didn't go very far. And there was the Red Sea. And all of a sudden, Pharaoh is coming with his army and his chariots. And Israel, you know, they didn't have any of those things. So, you know, they're stuck. And God puts a big cloud between them, you know, where that the uh, Egyptians can't even see them. They can't even find them. And they walk through the sea, the Red Sea, on dry land. Now, I know there's lots of people who who try to explain some physical reason for how that, that took place. You know, the parting of the Red Sea. But the waters were divided and the land was dry. They went through on dry ground. The uh, armies of Egypt, well, they decide that, you know, if they can go through there, well, so can we. So, you know, they go through and they all drown. You know, just about everyone I know is familiar with this story. You know, what a victory. You know, would you ever forget that? You know, it had to have left an impression. You know, I would think that on each of their minds, it was absolutely unbelievable. And in three or four days, they're complaining. Now, my text here says that these things were our examples. This is an example for us. We were redeemed. We didn't ask to be. Uh, we didn't want it. Uh, when we, it was when we were His enemies, when we were not seeking Him, when we were not living for Him. He died in our place. He redeemed us. You know, we can talk about, uh, you know, the logistics of Israel leaving the land of Egypt, but it, it should at least excite us to think about what was involved in God Almighty becoming incarnate 
putting up with his creatures, you know, submitting to situations over which he had absolute control, falsely accused, beaten, executed as a criminal so that you and I can live. Nothing, nothing that took place in the deliverance of Israel from the land of Egyptian captivity could be compared to that. And now I'm being asked to look back. You know, uh, that's some God we have. But three, four days later, they're complaining. Think, dearly beloved, think of what it costs God to become incarnate, to become my kinsman, to die in my place. I mean, the almighty, sovereign God, the creator of heaven, heavens, the heavens and the earth, the one who spoke the worlds into existence, hangs on a cross for me. How could I ever forget that? How could I ever complain? Now they come out, and and that's a that's a crucial question, you know. And I'm gonna I hope to answer that. How 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 could we how could they have ever complained? How could we complain? And now they come out of Egypt with a marvelous deliverance. I mean, think of it, you know. It's like, where are we going, man? Well, it's got to be paradise. This almighty, sovereign God, is He's delivering us from the captivity of Egypt. I mean, think of how wonderful it's going to be. It's a desert. There isn't any water. There isn't any food. There isn't any farmland. You know, they've got animals. Lots of them, most likely. You know, people, animals, they got kids to feed, and they're in a desert. And so are we. Behold, I send you forth as sheep among wolves. Don't misread that, folks. It doesn't say, I'm, I'm going to send you, you know, to a nice little church on the prairie, some prairie in Montana, you know. It, it doesn't say, you know, uh, there might be wolves there where I send you out. Be, be, be careful because there might be wolves there. No. I'm going to send you among wolves. Now, what kind of a shepherd, I've, I've said this before, what kind of a shepherd would do that? Well, ours did. And so we got those wolves, the mixed multitude. You're in the desert. There's no way to live in that desert, you know, there were a, a million people at least, if you, if you, if you count women and, and children. And, 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 you know, and then they've got the cattle and, 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 and no water, no crops, no land to cultivate. Desert, okay? That's where you are. Desert. Folks, do you have any idea the desert that you're in? You know, most of the church services today, and, and if you look, you know, if you look, uh, you know, at, on t at television, you can see it over and over again. People don't want spiritual food. They tire of that. They don't want to be fed with spiritual food. Christians in the main. You know, their only, uh, their only source of water in that desert was the rock that followed them. Your only source of water is this book. There isn't going to be some miraculous outpouring. You know, that came when the Holy Spirit finished this book. Your only source of spiritual nourishment to keep you from virtual starvation is this book. 
but you were sent forth as sheep among wolves. So the wolves are there. They're there. You were sent with the wolves into where the wolves are. You know, not maybe the wolves will come. They're there. They're, they're the mixed multitude that went out with the children of Israel. And they're the wolves that caused God's people to starve. Well, Steve, do we always have to have Bible study verse by verse? I mean, this. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd rather spend you spend more time on prophecy. I'd rather you spend more time, sometime talking about current news events, world events. You know, uh, you, you got to be kidding, folks. This this word is our only source of nourishment, and it's taken so lightly. We grab a text, we rip it out of context, and we and we, and we preach on it for something man to do. You know, his responsibility, something that he uh, must perform. And, and most people are, well, most people are, are uh, well, most people are not taught at all about what God did for them. You're not fed with television, modern literature, mainstream news. Uh, that's not where your food is, okay? I, I can get on here, I can ramble about all kinds of things. That's not where your food is. I have God's Word that they drank of that spiritual rock, and that rock was the Christ that's articulated. The Christ. This is the Christ, the Messiah. Their Messiah. Israel's Messiah. And here he's referred to in the Old Testament you know, Jehovah, that's the rock that followed them. That's where their water came from. And we have the illustration, of course, of, of striking the rock as Christ, as Christ was, was, you know, uh, that rock. Uh, Moses, well, he never entered the, the reason he never entered the promised land is because he struck it twice. Christ did not die for you twice. He didn't suffer for you twice. He suffered once and once for all. Think. I want you to think about that. How that Moses did not enter into to see the land that God had promised. That is an example, or that is a as a, a lesson to us that Christ is only going to die once and once for all. Beautiful picture. And so we rush over it so fast we miss seeing that picture. Folks were in a desert, and after such a great deliverance, within days, these people were murmuring and complaining. Okay? Manna wasn't enough. Manna was not enough. They got tired of it. They wanted more than what God gave them. They lacked contentment. They lacked faith, trust. He, here, God redeemed him. They were his people. He redeemed them. He freely delivered them from slavery, from bondage. And yet, only days after that, that, that he did that, they murmured and they complained. Okay? When his provision, mind you, was nothing but perfect. And the same is true today. Our spiritual manna is the Word of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. But many people, sadly, many people today are, are unsatisfied with that. And so they seek fulfillment elsewhere to satisfy their lusts. Okay? not just in the satisfying of the, of the physical flesh, but in that which precedes it. Spiritual lusts. I have pointed, I've said this, I don't know how many times. Theological error, folks, precedes moral error. Mm -hmm. You know, anything but the Word of God. Such as what, 
what what they can get from God or what God will do for them if they do something for God. Uh, you know, dearly beloved, they complained about God's direction. They complained about God's care and His provision. They wanted something better than what they had. Same is true today. If you ask me, that's what it means to want to return to Egypt rather than die in the desert. Uh, think about it. As an example to us, they were made, the text says, made, passive voice. They, did, they didn't make themselves overthrown in the wilderness. They were made to be overthrown in the wilderness so that you and I might not be overthrown in ours. You know, they were an example for us. We were redeemed by the mighty hand of God, the mighty power of God. Problem is, we don't look at that. You know? The possibility of this happening is, is, is inconceivable apart from God. The possibility of you being redeemed is inconceivable outside of the sovereign power of God, the sovereign will of God. Okay, You wouldn't be if it were not for Him. You did not redeem yourself in any way. How could the God who created the heavens and the earth come and die in my place as my kinsman? Well, He did. But now the righteousness of God separate from the law is manifested, witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, not your faith in Christ, but His faithfulness. He was faithful. And because He was faithful, you're redeemed. Are you happy being redeemed? It's because He was faithful. Not because you were faithful. And we need to realize that we're living among wolves. They're there. They're among us. They... And these folks were our, our examples. So we learn not to lust after evil things as they also lusted. The mixed multitude that was among them fell to lusting. That's the wolves that are among us. We have Peter saying, you know, that these divisions must come, that they that are approved may be manifest. The children of Israel, You know, they, they, they cried, they wept, and, and they said, who will give us meat to eat? They didn't like manna. They didn't like God's food. And as I've said, people today want anything but what we're doing right now. They want anything but Bible study, serious Bible study. I've had pastors say, you know, Steve, just lighten up on the, on the doctrine, okay? You know, doctrine divides. And folks, that's God's food. Can't we have man's food? You know, this, this person, that person, this testimony, that testimony, you know, this program, that program, anything that looks great, that feels great. You know, I'm telling you that God's people today don't like His food. Now, you may not agree with me, but they don't like Bible study. They don't like seriously looking at the Word of God. They don't. They, now they may say they do, but the minute you point out something about God's sovereignty or God's will, you know, they, they can't focus on Christ and what He did because their minds and their hearts are so dead set on focusing on themselves and what they have done or on what they feel they must do or and if that's not if and if and if it's not that, well it's on others, you know. 
looking at others, examining others, and judging others, and, and what they must do. And you know, They don't see His working in their lives as perfect. They certainly don't do that. But they wanted something else to eat other than what He provided. What has God provided for us to eat today? We feast on Christ, His Word. Okay. What people want is mir they want miracles, healings, tongues, spirit fillings, the second baptism, who knows what. Anything but the fundamental truth of God's Word. The basic fundamental truth of God's Word. Anything. Anything but that. We remember what we ate in Egypt, you know, mostly, you know, mostly garbage, you know, uh, onions, garlic. Now our soul is dried away because all we have is this manna before our eyes. Unbelievable. You know, you, you say lusting after evil things. Well, that's pretty, okay, that, I know what that is, Steve. That's pretty girls. You know, pretty horses, you know, I don't know what, you know, pornography, robbery, cheating, income tax evasion. I don't, I don't know what. The lusting that's referred to is, to is to desire something other than the food God provides. Think about that. You know, there's, there's all kinds of lusts. There's all kind of lusting in your life. And we always want to, right away, we always want to jump on the moral aspect of that. And, and folks, I am not in any way proposing that you be immoral. Okay? Alright? But sexual immorality always follows spiritual lusting. Always. Okay? Always. Theological error precedes moral error. They didn't like God's food. And I'm telling you that most of God's people today don't like His food. Neither be idolaters, as were some of them. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. You know, you make an idol because, you know, Moses is missing on the mountaintop someplace. I guess he got lost. I don't know where he's at. He's, he's not here. He's up there somewhere. We don't know where. Missing on the mountaintop somewhere. Don't know when he'll be back. Now, now you call a feast to worship Jehovah. Well, did you read that in Exodus? To worship Jehovah? These people wanted an idol. Okay? That's what people want today. You know, something I can handle, something I can touch, something I can see. I don't want spiritual food. I don't want a, a God that I can't see, that I can't talk to. I don't want a God that I can't hear, talk to, that I can't see. You know, God never says anything to me. You're wrong. All you have to do is pick up this book. He said an immense amount to you. And it's precious and it's wonderful to study. But you know, people want something tangible. They want something they can hold and something they, they can see. But they, they think that they're worshiping Jehovah and they sat down to eat and then they rose up to dance hilariously. And that's what always, that's, that is what always happens when it's an idol and it's not Christ. You know, when it's, when it's man worshiping something tangible and physical rather than the Word of God and the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. It leads to impurity. And it, does, and it does that without question. 
Neither let us commit fornication as some of them did and fell in one day 23,000. Now that number's, many are confused by that number. I, I don't have time to go into the difference between the, the 23 or uh, 1,000 that's mentioned here and another number mentioned elsewhere. Yeah, this is God that wrote this. He didn't contradict Himself. Uh, but there's what God calls spiritual fornication in God's Word. I pointed this out earlier on in the series. The people began to commit fornication with the daughters of Moab. Why? Because they liked the way Moab worshipped. I mean, can you imagine going to a temple? Now, now, you know, see, you can't go into the Holy of Holies. Oh, no, you can't do that. You can only go into the outer court. You know, if you want to have any contact with God, it's got to be through a priest. Think of how different that is under grace, folks. You know, and, and, and they're pretty humble surroundings. But if you go, but if you go with the Moabs, man, now you got you got temple virgins, and God, God knows what all else. I mean, so they committed fornication with the daughters of Moab. They called the people uh, to sacrifice to Baal. And Israel joined itself to Baal. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them. Neither let us test Christ, verse 9, as, as some of them also tested Him and were destroyed of serpents. Tempt. Test. The word tempt, tempt is the word test. The people spoke against God. They spoke against Moses. So they're testing. They're tempting Christ. They're testing Christ based on the leaders that God gave them. God gave them Moses and Aaron. Folks, do you believe He's working in us to will and to do of His good pleasure? Do you believe that, that His way is perfect? These people didn't. These were His people now, mind you. No, they, they didn't like Moses. They didn't like Aaron. You know, Moses and Aaron, they weren't doing a good, a good job. You know, they, in fact, they made a mess of everything. So they were destroyed of serpents. You know, Moses made a, a brazen serpent. You all know the story. Those who looked lived. They didn't do anything. They didn't have to even believe. If they just looked, they lived. But if they didn't, they died. And that, that does not mean that they went to hell. Okay? We're talking about God's people. Dearly beloved, you can easily ruin your life and still go to heaven. Okay, that's not, that's not the problem. Paul has just ended the last chapter. I don't want to be disqualified. Now, the inference clearly is, is, is you could be disqualified. Not, not that, not that you wouldn't be in, in heaven, but it'd be hay, wood, hay, stubble. It wouldn't be gold, silver, precious stone. And that's what we've been looking at in these chapters. And, and well, it's what we've been looking at in at least three chapters. Dearly beloved, you have certain freedoms. You don't, you don't have much. I mean, you don't have free will in the sense of determining your destiny. But you can choose to, to serve Him, to love Him, to believe Him, to reckon yourselves dead in, indeed unto sin. You know, the first command ever given in, in the epistles, the first command 
that, that appears in, in Romans 6.11, the very first command God ever gave you from, from His commandments, not the law, but, but His commandments, to count yourself dead to sin. Why am I dead to sin? Well, because Jesus Christ died in my place. And when He was crucified, I was crucified with Him. When He died, I died. Neither murmur. Verse 10. We, we see that they did that in Numbers. If you go to over to chapter 14 of Numbers, and all the, all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night, and all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. If you continue on reading that, it's, and again, the, uh, it says that the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness? You got to be kidding. That's where they are. They're in the wilderness. That's where you are. You're in, you're in the wilderness. You're in a desert land. And your food, you are in the desert, folks, and your food, your nourishment comes from this book. Neither murmur as some of them murmured and were, and were destroyed of the destroyer. All right, that expression occurs six times in the Bible. You see it first, the first time it ever occurs is in the Passover. And I believe it's the angel of the Lord. Interesting, isn't it? The angel of the Lord, you know, the one that passed over. You know. He actually can put to death some of God's people because they're murmuring against God. His plans, His program for their lives. Same angel, okay, can do that today. You have a sovereign, majestic, eternal God who is engineering your life, your walk, your health, your finances, everything and everything that this almighty God does is perfect and we're going to complain. You know, to, to trust Him is a wonderful experience. He does all things well. Well, if he does all things well, I'm never gonna I'm never gonna question him ever. Okay? Well, I just lied. Okay? Because I will. I don't know what those things are. You know, he can touch me any way he pleases because he's my God. He can do whatever he wants to with me. I was bought with a price. I belong to him. He can do whatever he wants with me. Now, all of these things happened unto them. Think of that. God engineered all of that that we're reading here, all of that in their lives. He, God engineered that for us. God is engineering your life. Are you glad those things happened to those in the nation of Israel so that you and I can learn that God's working in, in your life for someone else's benefit? Someone that you may not even know. Someone that you've maybe never never met, you know, who is blessed by what you 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 do. You know, I wonder how many lives have been changed by, by something someone said and or something that someone wrote, some some Facebook post someone posted, you know. And they don't, they don't and they didn't even know the person that that, that was affected. It was God in His sovereign power that used that truth. They were absolutely written for our ad admonition, for our instruction, upon whom, the text says, upon whom the ends of the ages 
or come. God has certain ages in His design. Dispensations, uh, if you get on a more technical term, but we're in the last one. Okay? There isn't going to be another age before the kingdom is established. We're, this is the last age. The, the next event after this age is, is the, the tribulation period and the establishment of the kingdom of Christ here on earth. We're in that last age. It was true in Paul's day. It's true today. Now here's what I want you to think about, folks. Between now and the time of my next video, I would love it if you would take a few, few minutes at least to think about this. Every single Christian standing in the church at Corinth stood before God as righteous as Jesus Christ, and yet they were told in the context of liberty not to lust after evil things as the Israelites did when God brought them out of slavery. Evil things, okay? That, that includes first and foremost not believing God concerning the Word that He's given you. Theological error always precedes moral error. You know, many of you are familiar with the verse, you know, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. I remember back in Bible college, you know, uh, we were sitting in a classroom and the instructor was up there in front and uh, the class was just getting ready to begin and, and he wrote a question on the chalkboard. You know, and that was, how do you walk in the Spirit? And he, he wanted everyone to write, get paper and pencil and write down their answer to that question. And there were about 30 in the class, I, I believe, somewhere thereabouts. And uh, just about every answer was different. I think the same would, would happen today if you got 30 people together and you said, well, how do we walk in the Spirit? You'd probably get 30 different answers. Including some which would say, well, uh, how do I, let's see, how, hmm, how do I walk in the Spirit? Well, I just walk in the Spirit. As if that's an answer. I'm asking you, how do we walk in the Spirit? We're, t we're commanded to walk in the Spirit. We're told to walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. That's wonderful. All i got to do is walk in the Spirit. How do I do that? How do I do that? Well, most Christians today think that that's just sort of a... a uh, an equivalent or something equal to to just obeying God, walking, you know, in in trying to be the best Christian you can be. You know, I want to remind you once again of the difference between the example of Israel that's being shown here to the Corinthians and the Corinthians themselves. Okay, were those in the wilderness, were they baptized into Christ? No, they were baptized into Moses. Did they have the indwelling, the fullness of the Holy Spirit living inside them? Okay, No, they did not. The Corinthian believers did. Were those in the wilderness, were they righteous, as fully righteous as Jesus Christ Himself? No, they were not. But the believers at Corinth were. I, I hope you're following what I'm, what I'm driving at here. God is telling the Corinthians not to do what they did. Okay? Here's the example. Okay? Don't do as they did. Well, why? Why, why does God even bother to tell us here in this chapter tell the Corinthians why is the Holy Spirit telling the Corinthians that the Israel the Israelites in the wilderness these were an example to us that we might not crave after evil things lust after evil things as they did well what difference does it make wait a minute I mean let's back up here a minute I thought we were been made the righteousness of God in Christ if you don't think folks that every single one of God's children there at Corinth 
was as righteous as Jesus Christ himself, then you, you're missing an important aspect. Uh, uh, you're, you're failing to comprehend an important aspect of this whole conversation. These believers in Corinth were as righteous as Christ himself in the inner man, the new man. They had a new man that could not sin, that was perfectly righteous. Now, how do you improve on something that's perfect? Now, we know the flesh profits nothing. Okay, God is not trying to clean up the old man in, these, in the lives of these believers at Corinth. But they have been made the righteousness of God in Christ. They have a new man that cannot sin. And yet they're told to not lust after evil things. They're, they're given the same... God desires the same out of the Corinthians that He desired out of His people Israel who, who, who didn't even have the same... We're, we're not even under the same dispensation, the same... I, I, I guess maybe I'm not explaining this very well. Uh, there's all kinds of ways to say this, but try if you can to imagine that you are one of those Israelites in the wilderness. Okay, you're not from some First Baptist Church of Atlanta. Okay, all right. The rock that followed them was the Christ. Okay, same God, same Christ, same Redeemer. Okay, God saved them, delivered them, redeemed them, delivered them, rescued them. The same as He does us. There's just one major difference here, and that is we, the church, is not Israel. Okay. How, I guess maybe a better way of, of perhaps asking the question, you know, here would be how do we do anything or why should we do anything that God asks us to do, commands us to do? Why should we take take and pay attention to any exhortation, any command, any admonition, the word beseech, anything that God entreats us to do or not do. You know, why should we pay any attention to it? Because we're already, we've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. We can't become any less righteous than what we are. We can't become any more righteous in Christ than what we already are. Why are we, why should we even bother, folks? I have been made the righteousness of God in Christ, so have you. That is an undeniable truth. So what difference does it make? Think about it. What difference does it make? Now before... You, you, you folks, some of you start sending me emails saying, Steve, I, man, I think you've totally gone off the rails. You're here, you know. Try to understand my point, okay? Their motive for obeying God, hearing God, listening to God, obeying God, doing what God said, and I want you to keep in mind, they didn't do anything of what God said. God Himself said that. You know, the law is, is, uh, cannot produce righteousness. But try and understand, if you can, how that these people, Israel, they obeyed God so that God would bless them. And do we do that today? Listen, dearly beloved, do we, is this what we do? Is, are, 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 do we set about to obey God so that God will bless us? Is that what we do? Well, many, many a Christian would say, yes, that's, that's exactly what we do. I'm here to tell you that is not. That's not the case at all. 
To preach devotion first and blessing second is to reverse God's order and preach law, not grace. You don't do something for God or, or you don't obey God or you don't try to please God so that God will do something for you. Let me tell you, that, that's just not true. Because He's not going to do that. You've got to reverse your thinking. Put the cart before the horse. The only reason that you do anything to please God, that you, the only reason you love Him is because He first loved you. Okay? You're not doing anything to try to an appease an angry God. You've been made the righteousness of God in Christ, and the reason you obey God, and the reason you love God, the reason you want to please God is because He's already so abundantly blessed you. He's blessed you with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. The blessings came first. The devotion comes is what follows that. That's grace, okay? That's not law. And that was not those Israelites in the, in the wilderness. That's not what they did. That's not how they functioned. That's not how they operated. That is not what God ex expected of them. The whole purpose was to show them that they could not keep the law. So when God tells us to not lust after evil things as they did, and I do not believe that's just talking about, you know, you know, pretty girls and por pornography or uh, a new bass fishing boat and whatever else you want to, you know, kind of imagine there. If you don't think that there are evil things within the church, what do you think the church is, the, you know, this, the places that we go to meet, to fellowship, to worship, do you think that they're, they're some somehow they're places that are they're free from evil they're immune from evil that there's no there's no evil going on there or just in your walk and in your relationship with Christ your your thinking your thinking about Christ can be evil okay i think the heavy emphasis here folks it's and it's hard not to see it is that the problem that that we see going on here is, is that it was it's, it was a matter of of faith and trust and dependence on the God who spoke uh, the worlds into existence and spoke to not not just spoke the worlds into existence but spoke to his people Israel and they didn't do what he said to do. In fact, they did everything he said not to do. And yet he loved them. He didn't forsake them. But the whole purpose for the giving of the law was to show that man was incapable of keeping that law. We're going to continue on in, in thinking about this and looking into this and studying this here in the next few days. I love you all. I truly do. I've run out of time. Thank you for your continued participation with us in these studies. Thank you for continuing to pray for the direction of this ministry. Until next time. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.